Carnegie Day, the Carnegie Brass come into play. They're an awesome epitome of what chamber music is. So for those of you in chamber music, take note. They are fantastic. They are also all alumni of this university. So if you are thinking of applying, this is what you could be in the future. Oh, it's going to be really fantastic. So let's give a warm welcome to Carnegie Brass. <laughs> wreck on the parkway, folks, so please give us a moment. We were kind of uh, stuck in traffic for a little bit, so we're a little bit behind. that I'm quite shocked about, and um, that is that we, I, I never really count, and I'm sure you don't count days or years too much, but I realize that we've been in existence making music together for this year, 35 years. Gasp. <laughs> My mother's 35. <laughs> yeah, it's, um, it's a kind of a very humbling, thing, but it's also 
kind of cool uh, because if, if it not anything, uh, the stick together spirit uh, which makes success is something that we can boast. Uh, because as a group, we've literally traveled the world and um, performed probably thousands of concerts uh, in various venues, including Carnegie Hall in New York City. Uh, we played a piece, we played a number of uh, occasions there. Uh, so and again, anyway, it's great to be here today to play with you all, uh, play for you all, excuse me. Um, Going down uh, the instrumentation, the, the, the classic brass quintet or the small chamber group that we're playing uh, today is comprised of, uh, it didn't exist forever. It came along in the 50s, in the 1950s. Uh, does anybody know the first brass quintet recorded? Um, nobody knows, nobody knows. History, music history here. Uh, the first brass quintet was founded in, in the mid 50s by the New York Philharmonic, and they called themselves the New York Brass Quintet. Uh, what they did basically, up until that point, brass, small brass groups were two trumpets and two trombones, a very traditional uh, method of playing mostly sacred music, and uh, no one had ever really uh, branched out into what we are today. So the New York City, New York uh, Philharmonic Brass section decided to kind of open up the idea of including uh, the French horn, because it's kind of an extraction out of the orchestra, the brass section of the orchestra. And of course, the French horn and tuba join the trumpets and trombone. Uh, and of course, you will, of course, see as many variations uh, as, as we would. So anyway, in that early time, uh, they uh, decided to try to figure out, to commission music and try to find literature that is appropriate for the brass quintet. Most music, as you know, all you composers and arrangers know that there's only three notes in a chord, sometimes four. And so to participate and to double and use all the rules of what makes music sound good, uh, you began to uh, try to adjust and try to find music that, that works and fits this ensemble. Uh, this next piece is a Mozart piece uh, that the New York Brass Quintet arranged. It's uh, kind of from that early period. Uh, it is a piece that you vocalists should know. Uh, it's from Mozart's virtuoso soprano work uh, called Exultate Jubilate. Uh, it's a beautiful piece for soprano. Anybody who's a soprano here would know that it's a great challenge and a great triumph if you can sing it, even just to get through it because it ends up with this wonderful bubbly uh, alleluia, uh, which uh, is uh, kind of exciting for the soprano and the orchestra. This is adapted, as I mentioned, for the brass quintet, and as I think you'll find that the music translates very well to brass uh, if it's played well. And it features uh, Jeff Nick, uh, I didn't introduce the players yet. Let me do that just before we start. Um, this is uh, David Pika is our French horn player. Um, uh, then it's, uh, Jeff Nicodemus is trumpet, Bernie Black trumpet, Glenn Whalen trombone, and my name is David Knapp and I play the tuba. So here we go. This is the um, Mozart Alleluia from Exultate Jubilate. <coughs> Thank you. 
right, um, as I mentioned, the, brass, the modern brass quintet uh, in our career does a number of um, various functions in music, uh, a lot of ceremonial music. You're familiar with uh, commencements, and the, some of you have played, uh, and you know what that's about. Uh, quite frankly, a lot of weddings, a lot of those types of events that are formal in nature that require kind of a grandiose <coughs> sort of style. Um, some, as I mentioned, some uh, literature, we won't play any today, but a lot of literature has actually been commissioned for the brass quintet. That is, you know, kind of concerto type works uh, that are a body that are like serious and sometimes very modern and very challenging. Uh, but for the most part, I think you would agree, as young musicians, uh, a lot of that literature becomes very much part of academia. Uh, no one calls us to play an extremely harsh, modern sounding piece. Uh, they just don't do it because I think would you, you would agree that most music is something that should be pleasing or exciting to the ear. That challenge uh, understood, we draw, as you just heard, from some very traditional classic literature, classical literature. And this next piece is actually 1999. Uh, it was um, Celine Dion and Andre Bocelli, um, pop song voted uh, the most uh, popular, best loved popular song from 1999, and uh, this would be titled The Prayer. You've probably heard it, uh, and it's a lovely piece of music, so it gives us a chance to play some songs that are more contemporary in nature. Very good.
uh, I've always personally been a fan of Anto Antonio Carlos Jobim. Anybody here of that uh, composer? You have, you have. Yes, in the back. Of course, uh, he kind of created a great sensation in the 60s. And to this day, I mean, if you go on YouTube, you'll find a lot of his original music. Uh, and it's still really pretty much a sensation to this day. Uh, because what he did was found a niche for himself. And it's a challenge to you as musicians to do the same thing. To find some way to, to make, uh, bring alive literature and make something very popular and that's appealing to the ear. Well, Jobim is a composer, pretty much, and an arranger as well. And he um, hails from uh, Rio in Brazil, where the, where the World Cup's being played. And uh, this sound that he created is, to this day, again, very popular because it's a very kind of soft uh, Brazilian jazz sound that really had never internationally been heard before. People were familiar with Latin-style music, but uh, Brazilian jazz is just slightly different. Well, uh, we're going to take a little bit of a chance here uh, because we've never played any Jobim as a brass quintet. When you think of uh, Jobim, you think of a, a drums and bass and a vocalist or maybe guitar. Uh, and so we're going to see how this works. This is a brand new arrangement uh, written for some good friends of ours, and they faxed it to us uh, and literally last night. So we're going give to give it a go to try it. It doesn't look too difficult. Uh, so we're going to, for the first time, actually sight read a piece for you. Uh, but it, again, it's kind of a soft jazz. So I don't think it'll be too uh, challenging. But tell us, tell us what you think. See how it goes. This is um, Jobim's "The Girl from Ipanema," and if you know the words, sing along. You know, actually, some of you do. Please don't. Just kidding.
Thank you. Um, that brings me to another bit of information for you, and that is about your career as a player. Uh, I assume all of you, because you're here, uh, you know that um, this is what you want to do. I know that when I was your age, like most of us, we knew that we wanted to be involved in this wonderful art form and spend the rest of our lives finding every possibility uh, of embracing it. Uh, as we've already discussed, the Brass Quintet for us is a chamber group. Uh, it is a small group, and we encourage you strongly to um, have a small group, regardless of whatever uh, form it is in. Uh, make sure that you have a small group that you play with on a regular basis, that you rehearse and write for and, and play only the music you love to play and nothing else. And that is a very critical component, I believe, to kind of living and surviving uh, and thriving as a musician. Uh, but there are other ways of surviving and thriving as a musician, and by necessity, uh, I don't know, unless someone can challenge me on this, I don't think there's one full-time professional brass quintet in the entire world. Maybe the Empire? Or the Canadian brass, maybe? Yeah. Probably the Canadian brass. That's about it. So that's only five people that work full-time at this. You probably noticed in that last piece that you heard a very kind of commercial sound coming from our trumpet players. Uh, well, both of them, uh, including Mr. Pika, play in the River City Brass Band. Uh, Ms. Along with Mr. Whalen, the trombonist, uh, they will, and he will, from time to time, play uh, civic light operas where you're playing musicals and shows. Uh, so your versatility as a player has to be boundless. There can't be any boundaries on what you do and what you're capable of doing and pursuing very uh, rigorously. Um, so with that, we again strongly encourage you to find a niche and uh, as a small group, but make sure that you, it's understood in the world of music that your integrity and your ability to play anything at a moment's notice is impeccable. Question? Yes, somebody, was that a question, or are you no. just pointing to there? No, it's a question, I'm sure. That wasn't a question. <laughs> he, was, he was doing this. <laughs> Noah will have a question in a second. Well, anyway, uh, so let's go back to where the brass quintet comes from, as I mentioned, from the orchestra. But, you know, curiously enough, it goes back even a little further. It goes back to military times in the mid-19th century, uh, the brass band. The brass band is, uh, uh, you've heard of probably the River City Brass Band, which you from out of town know it's a professional brass band here in Pittsburgh, uh, which numbers 27 players. Well, the military uh, used brass bands in the Civil War. And there was at one point, I believe this is an amazing statistic, between the North and the South, there were over 35,000 brass players working for either the North or the South. And the purpose of those players were to keep everyone inspired, to march along and play marches, and do a whole host of things. So the governments of both the North and South bought thousands and thousands of brass instruments. Well, the war ended. Guess what happened to all of those brass instruments? laid around in warehouses, and a lot of times what happened would be that people would say, listen, let's give it to orphans, and let's give it to poor kids, and let's, uh, let's give, get these instruments out into the world. Well, some of them still survive today, but uh, one little guy who uh, was given a cornet uh, turned out to be one of the greatest uh, musicians ever in the history of the world, uh, and he didn't even know how, he was so talented he just picked up music instantly as a player. And he was a cornet player, a trumpet player, by the name of Louis Armstrong. Uh, out of that early time, in the turn of the century, came a music that was based in the New Orleans style, which we would call Dixieland today. Um, this Dixieland style that, it, as it were, came out of brass band processionals for funerals, and where they would just pick it up and make it a little more interesting to play and to listen to. Uh, and so there's a whole style or genre that comes out of that and kept growing and growing to what it is today, what we know, what's known as American jazz. Well, this next piece is from that early period. Uh, it's, uh, who wrote this stuff? Sorry. Clarence Williams. Clarence Williams writes a piece from this period uh, in New Orleans uh, called The Sugar Blues. Here it is. <coughs> Thank you. 
In every uh, communication we do here, um, we would like to open uh, up the discussion uh, for you, your impressions, or questions you have uh, for us regarding uh, the music or, or what we do as musicians. I did mention also that uh, I think, yeah, virtually all of us are involved in education. So if you're looking at a career in music, I urge you to make sure that you have uh, the wherewithal to prepare yourself uh, for a career as a, as a teacher, whether it be private or in a school setting uh, or in a college setting. Uh, it can be a very uh, rewarding and satisfying part of the career. I think what probably what you're hearing also is that our reality as a group may be different than others, but it's probably, I suspect, pretty much the same in the respect that you're gonna have to do a lot of different things to, uh, to make it as a player because uh, I mean, there's no such thing as a starving artist, not really. Uh, you, you're not going to make it in New York unless you are doing a whole lot of different functions. And hopefully, if you're a smart young musician, you'll figure out how to make all of those things be related to each other. And that's why I mentioned uh, studying uh, also for education. H any questions, please? Thank you. All questions have been answered. Um, yes, sir. Uh, the difference. Uh, well, there's different alloys. Uh, we're basically, uh, if you're not a brass player, if you're a brass player, you know this. We're basically, we're. It's just great plumbing. Uh, you know, it's we're just. It, we're, you know, you take the, the average run-of-the-mill plumber and give put them on steroids and uh, make them do some really fine plumbing uh, to tune the air column. It's very much like the, the string instruments or clarinet or anything, uh, and that's why we have valves and so forth. Uh, most all of these, actually, all of these instruments. 
are the, at the core made out of brass or some type of brass alloy. Uh, you're, of course, looking at them. I know I'm thinking that doesn't look like brass. Uh, that's because they are uh, plated with silver or sometimes nickel. Uh, you'll notice my instrument is what is called red brass. Uh, that means it has some copper in it, and it also has nickel silver as well. So there's various combinations and alloys, but fundamentally, all of these instruments do, in fact, fall into the idea of being a brass composition. Uh, it doesn't, um, it, it holds up well in weather. And uh, believe it or not, that's, if you really go way back to the time when brass players were playing from the towers and castles, uh, it had everything to do with the fact that you could play them outside in the rain. And, uh, the, the instruments that have the, that are colored more like this one, <coughs> yeah, red brass. The, this had, uh, called red brass, but it just means there's more copper in there as an alloy than just like, the, red, the trumpets are just all gold brass underneath this silver. This now, has know. copper in it, this has, that makes it just a little bit darker. You may see some gold plating. Is there any gold plating in those stuff at this point? No, that one. Uh, occasionally, you will see some gold plating, too. Um, just to give another alloy, gold's very resilient. Uh, always on mouthpieces. I encourage you brass players to get gold plated mouthpiece uh, in case you have any difficulty with, um, with uh, allergies and things like that. They last a long time. Our instruments, uh, brass instruments, also last a long time if you take care of them. Uh, not entirely true, but I guess it's true with every instrument if you take care of it. Make sure that you really clean, keep everything clean and oiled and well-educated. It'll take care of you. We have friends that play saxophones uh, that are from the 50s. And the instruments, uh, mine's a 1982 Miraphone, so that's, I'd say, probably getting out there in age as well. Uh, so they'll last a long time for you. Any other questions? I was going to add one thing to that. Uh, personal choice, you know, we uh, like the way some of these instruments respond, you know, different than other instruments, so it's, uh, we pick them based upon our own personal preference. And what you have to play. Yeah, I was going to say, yeah. You know, when, when, when actually owns a silver trombone also, oh, yeah. completely different. It depends, yeah, depending on what you're going to play, it has everything to do with who's hiring you to play. Uh, and if you're pl hired to play Shostakovich in an orchestra, uh, you're going to probably play a, as big a possible instrument because the style calls for it, and the grand orchestral style calls for it. Uh, in particular, uh, Mr. Wayland, our trombone player, plays a lot of bass trombone. And so that depends, again, on what's the style, what's the show, uh, what, it, what is it going to call for. And quite frankly, sometimes your music director is going to tell you, and I'm sure many of you it's already happened to, they go, well, I, I don't, that's too small. Or that's too big of an instrument. I want to hear a different kind of tone, etc. So always be ready in that capacity as well to know that you should have several. Is, what kind? Of, what do you? What do you play? Violin. Violin and piano. Well, violins are really cost prohibitive. Uh, they can get really expensive. So it's not as typical for a violinist to have several violin, violins. But as you probably know, as a pianist, pianos do vary, and uh, sometimes depending on the piece you're playing or the style, uh, music directors or conductors that are going to want a particular kind of instrument, although that's the same ballpark. Sometimes you play what's there. Uh, in this, there's two Steinways backstage. There's no Rosenberger back here. Uh, so it's, you, you play on the instrument that's provided for you. Uh, hopefully it's a good one, as you will see in your career. Uh, hopefully. No? Yeah, um, I was, I was going to say, I was playing a jazz gig. I have this bell with the saxophone. I would take this bell off and put a le uh, one that has less copper in it, so that it would be brighter sounding. Right. Yeah. That's good. And uh, that's probably true for the violin. I think you're going to find strings are affected. Strings matter, and bows, and styles of bows, just depending on the style. So again, uh, we're going to finish up here uh, in case Frank Sinatra. this has been what? Frank Sinatra. We want to do the Frank Sinatra. What do you want to do? Yeah, both. Please. Okay. Let's do both of those to finish up. We have a good friend in Pittsburgh who's by the name of Ralph Guzzi. Ralph Guzzi is a very talented arranger. He's published and uh, recorded pretty much internationally. And uh, he wrote these two uh, Frank Sinatra pieces especially for us. He's a wonderful arranger. I mentioned arranging as an important part of your skills. I assume you all have software that, that takes care of that kind of thing. Uh, 
uh, and to learn the skill of arranging and adapting, it's going to help you a lot in your future as a player. Mm -hmm. uh, we also, on behalf of the Carnegie Brass, we hope you have a great summer and continue to play and make sure that you enjoy doing it because that's 99% of it is, is having fun and enjoying the music that you're playing or finding enjoyment in it in any capacity. So we're going to finish with two uh, pieces that are fairly short. Uh, they're from one of my favorite uh, singers, Frank Sinatra, in that great period in the, the 60s when he was singing in Las Vegas and recording a great deal of music. Uh, always had in your discography some Frank Sinatra uh, and his uh, Ranger Nelson Riddle because it's some of the best big band and uh, stylized American style uh, commercial music that was ever uh, brought forth. So the first one is Love and Marriage. Love and Marriage. And then the second one is Come Fly With Me. So I hope you enjoy it. And again, thank you for your attention and have a great rest of the summer. Here we go. Thank you. 